Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Thursday, March 3rd. And tonight we're talking about the efforts to stop Russia's attack on Ukraine. Today, more Russian oligarchs are facing sanctions from the U.S. We'll get into who they are and why this matters. This comes just hours after Russia captured its first city in Ukraine, Kherson. We'll tell you more about this southern port city and give you a quick Ukrainian geography lesson. Plus, the former Louisville detective involved in the Brianna Taylor raid has been found not guilty. And there are a lot of new developments in the January 6th investigation. You'll also hear what the former attorney general is saying now about former President Trump. Let us begin tonight with breaking news from the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, and it is in Ukraine. We're getting word from the mayor of a town called Energodar, which is not far from Zaporizhia. You're looking at a live web picture of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. If you know anything about nuclear power, that name probably stood out might have made some of the hair stand up on the back of your neck, because according to reports, Russians are attacking this nuclear power plant. They have apparently started shelling the plant. It supplies Ukraine with at least a quarter of its power. And as we mentioned, it is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. A tweet from Ukraine's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dmitry Kuleba, reads in part, quote, if it blows up, it will be 10 times larger than Chernobyl. Russians must immediately cease the fire, allow firefighters establish a security zone, unquote. That is a tweet from Dmitry Kuleba, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs, essentially the equivalent of the Secretary of State in Ukraine. There are a number of reports of people who have been trying to defend this power plant. We're going to be as judicious as we can showing you these live pictures because, of course, we're looking at an active war zone, right? We're looking at battles that are in progress, and God forbid we should be in the middle of this disaster in Ukraine getting even worse than it already is. Now, we don't have independent confirmation of a number of the details of what's going on right now, but the breaking development this evening that we'll get to in just a second with Cal Perry is that the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which you're looking at now from this webcast picture, in Ukraine is under attack by Russian troops. This power plant is kind of in the southern part, sort of southeastern Ukraine, down near the Dnieper River, kind of not far from Mariupol, if you remember where Richard Engel had been reporting in the last few days. The Dnieper River is the waterway that kind of cuts through the middle of Ukraine, kind of separates it east from west. There had been fighting in a number of cities that were further on the southern end of that river, kind of where it meets the Black Sea. So the effort to sort of close in on Ukraine from all sides makes sense in a way when you think about where this plant is located. And of course, if you cut power, that's one way of continuing to frustrate the civilian effort to fight off the Ukrainians. But the idea that this attack would be happening on an active nuclear power plant is a whole other matter. You remember earlier in this conflict that the Russians came in from Belarus, which is north of Ukraine, and cut south to take the Chernobyl nuclear plant. That plant is closed, contained, that whole area has been sealed off, and the value of that was there was sort of a north-south passage that would take you from Chernobyl down into the city of Kyiv. This is a different situation. This is an active plant. We're working on trying to get more information about what exactly is going on there. Of course, we've got this live image, and we have got another video that we're working on turning around of forces fighting their way around the plant, trying to defend it from the Russian onslaught. But again, the latest we have is this live stream showing what appears to be Russian attacks at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which is the largest nuclear plant in Europe. It provides between a fifth and a quarter of Ukraine's power overall. Heaven help us if that plant becomes the site of another disaster to make this humanitarian crisis even worse. And again, Dmitry Kuleba, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Ukraine, tweeted about a half hour ago, quote, Russian army is firing from all sides upon Zaporizhia NPP, nuclear power plant, the largest nuclear plant in Europe. Fire has already broke out. If it blows up, it will be 10 times larger than Chernobyl. Russians must immediately cease the fire, allow firefighters establish a security zone. This is just one piece of the ongoing crisis in Ukraine 
We do know that at least one generating unit at this plant has caught fire. You can see those wisps of look like, what look like some kind of clouds or smoke, presumably. That's the fire coming from one of the generating units. But again, we're not on the ground there. We have this image, and we're trying to interpret the pictures as carefully as we can and to also get more independent confirmation of the nature of exactly what is going on. But this is just one more call that the world will put on Russia to stop what's happening on the ground there in Ukraine. There's also the effort to try to help Ukrainians, especially those Ukrainians who are here in the United States. In addition to these live pictures, which we're going to continue to monitor, this evening we also learned more about how the Department of Homeland Security is responding to all of this. DHS has announced that it's going to offer temporary protective status to Ukrainians for a span of 18 months. Now, TPS allows them to remain in the United States because obviously they cannot return home safely. Bear in mind, this only applies to Ukrainians who have lived continuously in the U.S since Tuesday, March 1st. So this spares those Ukrainians from being sent back to Ukraine. It does not affect whether today's refugees would be let into the U.S. On top of that, the Biden administration is putting more pressure on Russia, its richest citizens and companies. The president announced more sanctions today at his cabinet meeting. Listen. The uh, severe economic sanctions on Putin and all those folks around him, choking off access to technology as well as cutting off access to the global financial system. It's had a profound impact already. And the goal was to maximize the impact on Putin and Russia and to minimize the harm on us and our allies and friends around the world. Our interest is in maintaining the strongest unified economic impact campaign that Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin spoke to his nation and to the world today. He continues to stand by his decision to invade Ukraine. Granted, he spoke before this fire, saying, quote, I will never give up my conviction that Russians and Ukrainians are one people, unquote. Frankly, that conviction is precisely why some Russians say this war is so heartbreaking. NBC News Now anchor Tom Yamas caught up with a couple in Lviv that was heading west to Poland. We waited, everything was like, you know, every day shelling, 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 shelling. We tried to go to the shelter, there is no place. And for a little child, it's not okay, it's cold and everything. So I don't want my daughter to get sick, plus running from the Russian, this is not okay. One week in this, uh, in this war, yeah. you can't think and make plans. Sometimes you are texting your friends and you don't understand what you are speaking because your brain not working yeah. good. So we just step by step according to situation. Now we're in Lviv. Next step, go to Poland. Now, as for the efforts to stop this war, diplomats from Russia and Ukraine met again today. Russia's chief negotiator, Vladimir Medinsky, says they've reached an agreement. They are apparently open to creating temporary humanitarian corridors to evacuate civilians. All of which puts a whole different context around our conversation with NBC's Cal Perry, who joins us now live from Lviv. Cal, let's start off with the latest breaking development in all this, this nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia. I'm not sure how much you know about the area or the attack, but what more can you add to this? So I can tell you about 24 hours ago, our viewers would have seen some dramatic footage of civilians standing in front of two tanks and two armored personnel carriers. That's about a mile from this power plant. It initially was enough to stop the Russian forces. Now, since then, in the last 12 hours, it started as a small arms firefight, that according to the National Guard here in Ukraine. And then in the past hour, the situation has, as you've been laying out, uh, disintegrated quite a, quite a bit. Uh, we saw a slow escalation of... Um, um, the Ukrainian government sounding the alarm to the international community. It started with the mayor who talked about a firefight and then a small fire that broke out in the power plant. And then we have this tweet that you've gone over from the foreign affairs minister uh, talking about a fire inside the plant and saying that this could be a disaster, quote, 10 times worse than Chernobyl in the last 10 minutes or so. Reuters, and I want to be careful on our sourcing here because, as you've said, we are not there on the ground. But Reuters is saying that firefighters cannot start extinguishing the fire at the Zaporizhzhia nuclear power plant because they are, quote, being fired on at point blank range. They are quoting there the energy agency here uh, in Ukraine. And then the other thing is in the last five minutes, we're hearing from the IAEA, the director general of the IAEA, quote, appealing for an immediate halt to the use of force at Endorhar, that is the name of the town, calling on military forces 
operating there to refrain from violence, quote, near the nuclear power plant. So um, this is uh, not just a strategic target of the Russians. Again, the largest nuclear power plant in Europe provides more than a quarter of the power in this country. They secure it. They flip the switch off. They turn the power out here on folks. It is cold. The heating will go out. In addition to that, though, you now have this scene before they can secure it of a firefight and a fire breaking out. So the Ukrainian government now sounding the alarm to the international community. Um, and I can bet the international community is probably uh, listening at this point, Joshua. I want to underscore something that Cal just said, by the way. We are not on the ground at this plant right now. Please, 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 as you're watching this and you hear the developments about this, just know we're going to do our best to couch where we're getting this information from. We will tell you if we've got something reported firsthand, and we will also tell you if we have to attribute this to other news organizations whose reporting and provenance we generally trust. But this is the best information we have on this at the moment. Just want to make that clear, just because breaking stories, especially out of war zones, move very fast and information changes very quickly. But Cal, regardless of what's happening now, I assume this is something that was contemplated before this whole crisis broke out. I mean, we were talking about this when the Russians pushed south from Belarus into the Chernobyl area, right? That this is a country that has nuclear power and that one or two wrong shots could make this go from a crisis to an outright disaster very quickly. Yeah, a, a catastrophe if there's one or two shots in the wrong direction. That's clear. And look, there's a strategic advantage to these sites. I mean, I've been talking to folks who are, uh, and government officials who are saying that, for example, in the northern part of the country, the Sumi region, there are five towns under heavy bombardment, and, and they, uh, the Russians just took out the local power grid, right? They took out the local power grid to try to choke the local population there, to try to really literally freeze out the civilians who are hunkered in bunkers um, as they indiscriminately are, we are being told, shell these areas. The nuclear power plant at Zaporizhia would be an easier way of clipping the power. Again, we don't know that that is what they are doing, but you can surmise militarily that's why they started moving in on it some 24 hours ago. I don't know that the Ukrainians had necessarily seen it as an alarm type situation, that there could be this firefight and this fire, uh, but that's what's now happened again, according to Ukrainian officials. With regards to the other crises in this whole situation, what's the latest you can tell us in terms of what's happening with the influx of refugees that's been moving west to get away from areas like Zaporizhia to try to make their way to Poland and other countries west? So in the last 24 hours, the U.N. confirming that over a million people have already fled this country. That is a million refugees uh, in one week. That number does not include the folks who are internally displaced, the folks who are not registered with any NGO or the United Nations or local officials. And of course, a country at war is a country that really cannot handle the bureaucracy of it at the beginning. So we, we know those numbers are going to be delayed. The city that I'm in um, is starting to become overwhelmed. It's starting to become crowded. Um, um, the news, like the one we're discussing in the last hour, is only going to add to this humanitarian crisis. People are going to start fleeing uh, more and more of the areas as the Russians move in. They, they're really hitting on two fronts, from the north and from the south. They're moving up south from Crimea, and they're moving down from Belarus and from Russia uh, towards the capital of Kyiv. And as they, as they choke these cities, and as they shell uh, these cities, it's going to make the humanitarian crisis worse, because, of course, the numbers are going to become overwhelming. If it's a million within a week, where will we be in a month? And it doesn't seem as though the Russians are stopping. It seems as though they've been slowed down. I mean, certainly it seems as though the Ukrainian army, as well as Ukrainian civilians, are slowing them down. Uh, but they're still making their way towards these urban areas. And as I said, they're starting to shell them now, which is only going to cause more people to flee, Joshua. One more thing i got to ask you, since we mentioned that there is supposedly more diplomatic possibility for some kind of a humanitarian corridor to get supplies in and get people out. President Volodymyr Zelensky held a news conference today. NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel was there. Here is his question to President Zelensky and the president's answer. Watch. Vladimir Putin has so far not been willing to meet with him. Do you have a message for him now that Ukrainian cities are under attack? This city is under attack. A convoy is on its way here. Is there a way to prevent this war from escalating even further now? It's not about I want to talk with Putin. I think I have to talk with Putin. The world has to talk with Putin because there are no other ways to stop this war. 
That's why I have to. Cal, before I have to let you go and let me know if you have to, to get moving, I, I know there's a lot going on around where you are, but before I got to let you go, what more do you know in terms of the diplomatic efforts that are going on and frankly, whether the Ukrainians are optimistic or pessimistic that they will bear any fruit? Suspicious. Suspicious is the word that I would use. You know, you, you talk to government officials here, and certainly we've heard this um, from these negotiations, this this consistent line that how, how do we negotiate well under fire? While the negotiations were happening along uh, the border with Belarus, the towns were being were being shelled mercifully, in the, especially in the north of the country, just brutally. The, the mayor of one town saying that uh, civilians were just trapped in basically buildings, buildings that had become uh, cold coffins. So, look, I, I think the president needs to talk to the Russians exactly as he's saying. He needs to show the people here that he's willing to do anything to save lives on the ground. The realistic nature, though, of a humanitarian convoy uh, doesn't seem to be very likely, especially when you talk about the fact uh, that the Russians are slowly encircling these towns and not allowing civilians out. And, and in the last 24 hours, I've conducted a series of interviews with civilians who were flying, uh, fleeing as far as Kharkiv and then would come through the capital and on these trains packed with civilians where there was violence happening all around them as they were trying to to leave. So I, I think it would take a major diplomatic breakthrough to see some kind of humani humanitarian corridor actually take place. And look, keep in mind, the language on this was a little bit cagey. It was, we've reached a framework for future, future discussions on a humanitarian corridor. So while it is being discussed, I don't know how optimistic people are really here on the ground, Joshua. Thank you, Cal. Please do stay safe. That's NBC's Cal Perry starting us off tonight from Lviv. Let's go back to the story that we've been following since the top of the hour, this nuclear power plant in Ukraine that has reportedly come under attack. NBC's Phil McCausland joins us now. And Phil, you've been doing some reporting about the threats to nuclear plants, of which there are four in Ukraine. The threats that they faced even before this war broke out, you'd been doing some reporting on what that might look like based on the little that we've heard so far. And again, the reporting is still very early. What are kind of your top lines right now based on what this attack would represent? Yeah, Joshua, like you said, I think it's important to emphasize it's still early and we don't have anything necessarily exactly confirmed yet. But I mean, what the main concerns were that these four power plants have 15 operating nuclear reactors. The real concern here is that they would be damaged in a conflict left unmaintained by the staff. Um, these have to be constantly operated by, by a dedicated staff um, constantly ensuring that there's no meltdown, that there's uh, nothing overwhelms it. Um, something that we saw, for example, at Three Mile Island uh, was was close to that. Um, it's also important that they're not cut off from the larger power grid, uh, which is needed to cool the reactors as well. Um, that's why they have um, large scale diesel generators uh, to maintain um, those those power plants and uh, ensure that they are able to cool those reactors if they needed to do a shutdown. Obviously, all of that is, is very volatile. Although these reactors, according to uh, Ukraine, are able to withstand something as large as an impact from a, uh, an aircraft. However, just emphasizing again, what we need to be worried about here is whether or not um, we can get uh, the crews in there, particularly firefighters, who may be currently under threat. Um, that's one uh, thing that Ukrainian officials have emphasized right now, now that they can't get firefighters in. Um, so that is one thing uh, that we could potentially be afraid of here. Can you just level set for us a little bit in terms of the nature of what this threat might be? I don't want to, you know, I don't want to overblow this, right? This war is already scary enough. And, you know, in a vacuum of information, your imagination can, can go to some very dark places. But... Clearly, a catastrophe at a nuclear plant is no small matter. Level set for us a little bit. Based on where this plant is, how big it is, how much power it generates, what's at stake here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, last week we're, we were all worried about Chernobyl, right? Um, uh, Chernobyl, however, is in a 1,000-square-mile uh, exclusion zone, which means, uh, you know, it, there's not a lot there. These power plants are closer to cities and towns, some of them large, um, and their fuel is much more radioactive than Chernobyl. Uh, so if we're thinking about an incident like Chernobyl, we're looking at something that would be much larger here uh, in um, this, this particular area. Um, again, there's, I mean, there's three other power plants. This is the largest one, however. 
So, I mean, whatever occurs here is really scary. And, and speaking to experts, I, I, I got the sense that they did not even want to consider necessarily what that would look like exactly. Um, a lot of them had a lot more faith in, in Russia, particularly considering its history with nuclear power, would be very careful about um, firing at all close to these power plants. Um, one expert even said, you know, I, my feeling would be that they would even bring in crews in order to operate them if they were to capture them. Um, what it appears so far, though, uh, again, we are uh, our confirmation is, is not quite fair, um, is, is that they're not being as careful as we all had hoped. Yeah, with regard to that, one of the things that you mentioned in some of your recent reporting is that reportedly Russian forces have held the Ukrainian staff, at least by some accounts, hostage at Chernobyl and force them to keep working, according to the acting director of that site. NBC's Keir Simmons put a question to Sergei Lavrov, who is Russia's foreign minister, kind of Russia's equivalent of the secretary of state, about the decision-making calculus that Vladimir Putin is undertaking. Here's Keir's question and the foreign minister's answer. Watch. Minister, President Putin is described by many in the West as erratic and isolated. Can you reassure people about President Putin's reasoning? Is he taking advice? And when was the last time you were able to advise him? Uh, President Putin, in the past weeks, has provided detailed comments on our position. That is the position of our leadership. Phil, I know it's a dangerous game to try to get inside Vladimir Putin's head, but I think based on at least what the Russians are saying, something like a wanton attack on a nuclear plant would not make sense, that they would presumably understand the amount of danger that, that an attack on this facility would, would represent. Yeah, you, you would imagine so. And again, I mean, this was, I think, something that was unthinkable uh, to, to me reporting on this and, and to experts who I had spoken to. Um, it's tough to get in, in, inside Putin's head for sure. I mean, it's unclear whether this would be something that he would have directed um, or, uh, you know, whether this is an incidental assault or what exactly occurred here and, and what is the result, the cause of this fire. We have to be very, very careful, I guess, about how we characterize it. Um, but it is extremely scary. And, and you mentioned that, that those staff at, at Chernobyl, I think that's another thing that we have to be worried about here is, is this conflict going to make the workers on these nuclear power plants afraid to come to work? If they're going to be held hostage um, or if they're going to come under attack like this, that, again, just it really raises the stakes here and, and makes this a really scary situation, not just for this power plant, but for the three others in the country. NBC's Phil McCausland with a little bit more context on nuclear power. Phil, thanks very much. Thank you. We will keep an eye on this story again for those of you who are just looking in. We're keeping an eye on what appears to be some kind of a firefight, some kind of an attack on the nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia in Ukraine that's in the southern, kind of southeastern corner of the country near the southern end of the Dnieper River, which is the river that runs through the center of Ukraine, kind of separates it east from west. Ukraine's foreign minister has claimed, at least in a tweet, has expressed his concern that if this plant blows up, it would be, in his words, quote, 10 times larger than Chernobyl, and he is asking for the Russians to cease fire and establish a security zone and allow firefighters through. As we heard from Phil McCausland, that of course is key, not only to prevent fires at the plant, apparently one of the generators at the plant has already caught fire, but also to take care of the staff that are there. When the Russians attacked Chernobyl, they reportedly held the staff hostage to keep the plant working. And remember, nuclear plants don't just sit on their own. There's electricity that has to come into the plant to run some of the other components, including the cooling systems that prevent the reactors from melting down. So there is a potential cascading array of risks in this attack. But again, we're dealing mostly with external reports and the tweet from the foreign minister. I've been checking Volodymyr Zelensky's Twitter feed. I haven't seen anything from him lately. He's been pretty vocal on Twitter. I don't believe we have any more updates at the moment. And please do bear in mind, this is a war zone. We're doing our best to get you the most accurate information we can and to keep an eye on that web stream if and when it is available. So stick with us. When we learn more information, we'll definitely pass it on. And if we have to correct anything from this report, you'll be the first to know.
This is just one of the many attacks on key Ukrainian cities with key infrastructure. And those attacks have been intensifying, including what we're watching tonight. A number of cities are suffering mass casualties, power outages, and more. From our colleagues at Sky News, national correspondent Alex Rossi has more. As this war gets uglier, Russia's tactics are becoming more violent and destructive. This video from Chernihiv shows a missile strike on a residential apartment block. The blast wave shakes the entire city. Whilst the building burns, emergency workers rescue dazed civilians. And the situation in other parts of the country is just as desperate. This is Borodyanka, but as these pictures show, it could just as easily be a suburb in Syria. The damage goes on as far as the eye can see. What do you want from us? Go away from our land. You don't want to leave now? Sit down with me at the negotiation table. I'm available. Sit with me, but not at 30 meters like you welcome Macron and Schultz and others. I'm your neighbor. You don't need to keep me at 30 meter distance. I don't bite. I'm a normal man. Sit down with me. Let's talk. What are you afraid of? On the south coast, Mariupol is now surrounded by Russian forces. There's a constant barrage of artillery smashing into this city on the Sea of Azov. Civilians have been trapped for days, basic essentials running out in many places. The mayor says even those fleeing have come under attack. They've been shooting at moving vehicles. A humanitarian convoy couldn't even leave the surrounding areas of our town. Today we're in a blockade, and to create tension in the town, they're shooting in the residential areas, targeting civilians, elderly people, children, to create internal panic. And in some places, Russian troops and tanks are now in control. The man recording these images of the invading force is clearly trapped and very frightened. I think I should stop recording before someone shoots me on my hand. The southern port city of Kherson is the first to fall to Vladimir Putin's forces, leaving people fearful about what the violent takeover will mean. It's a, like very scary because we hear a lot of explosions, uh, especially at night and early in the morning. And we're trying not to leave because I'm here with my grandmother now and um, um, we have enough food for a couple of weeks. Ukraine, though, has no intention of surrender. Even in places that have been overcome, Russian soldiers have been jeered and confronted by ordinary people. In this eastern town, which has supposedly been pacified, a Russian soldier carries two grenades after a meeting with the mayor to ensure he's not attacked by the crowds. And despite the intensifying brutality, this is a nation that remains united and defiant. Ukrainian MPs gather to send a message to the Kremlin in Parliament. We had to, call, uh, to vote for the mobilization, for taking out Russian assets, for bearing arms, for uh, collaborationism, uh, and uh, for informational security, like for other, for many other, many, many things. They are singing the national anthem, but their words are being heard far beyond the walls of this chamber. Alex Rossi, Sky News, Eastern Ukraine. Let's continue from Ukraine with one of its political leaders. Lisa Yasko is a member of the Ukrainian parliament. She belongs to the Servant of the People Party. That's President Zelensky's party. Ms. Yasko, welcome to the program. Uh, good evening. First of all, how are you and your family doing right now? We are in quite desperate mood, of course, with uh, knowing that uh, there are no good news every day. and. Uh, my family are in different parts of uh, Ukraine right now. I managed to evacuate my mom from the center of Kyiv, bringing her more to the western border. 
of Ukraine, but my dad is in the center of Kyiv and my grandmother is in the center of Kyiv. They don't really have access to food. Um, there are problems with even buying a bread or, or a medicine. So unfortunately, the situation is not good. How are people getting by, especially in Kyiv? If you know, shops, stores, the shelves, I'm sure, have been bare for quite some time. How are, how are people getting by? Well, first of all, it's allowed only to, to walk uh, out only when, when there is no curfew. Um, and uh, then long queues in, in, in the shops, and still it's not possible to buy sometimes even basic things because we are still waiting for this humanitarian aid and for uh, basically for, for these uh, products, but they need time to get uh, to Kiev, you know, even if there is a transfer and a logistics arranged from abroad, it takes two or three days to get to Kiev from the western border with the current traffic and with all the checks and well, with all the security measures. How is Ukraine's political system doing right now? I mean, is the Ukrainian parliament still functional? Are you still able to perform some of your responsibilities or has it basically been suspended because of all this? No, we are, we are performing our duties. We have our online committee meetings. We even had the physical meeting today in, in, uh, in, of, of the parliament. Uh, and uh, we have different hybrid online meetings, um, but now it's the time of very good self-organization. Many of us are helping communities, uh, trying to uh, help with humanitarian aid. This is where we are much needed. And um, all country is, is screaming, you know, in the need for, for a help. And uh, our voice is very important. And uh, the voice uh, of parliamentarians speaking to the foreign colleagues, uh, explaining what kind of help do we need, uh, calling for no flying zone, calling for sanctions, calling for a military and humanitarian assistance. This is what we are doing right now. Are there certain parts of Ukraine that you're the most concerned about, just geographically, most concerned about Russia being able to claim? We know that there has been an increasing push to attack Ukraine's power plants. Is that one of the main targets you're concerned about, or are there others? Well, I'm concerned uh, about the capital. I'm concerned very much about the north of Ukraine. and. Uh, of course, also about the south and, and the east, but uh, as I said, there are no place in Ukraine that can be uh, called as safe right now, because uh, Russians are ta targeting through the air attacks, uh, different infrastructure, uh, military objects, um, even historical heritage. They, uh, they threw, um, uh, and a, a, like uh, an air attack, even in the Babi Yar, this is a Holocaust memorial, and five people were killed. So um, I'm I'm very worried about destroyed villages that we already have in different par parts of Ukraine. It's very heartbreaking and uh, very painful to see and to hear that stories of people who don't have their homes anymore because Putin destroyed them. Could I ask you, I know I have to let you go in a moment, but if I could just ask you in terms of where all of this goes and the aid that some people are asking Western nations to provide, a lot has been made of the decision by NATO allies, including the U.S., not to put troops on the ground and get involved in a fuller way in the fighting in Ukraine, including sending Air Force, uh, sending Air Force planes to enforce a no-fly zone. The concern, of course, is that if a U.S. or NATO uh, plane or tank or soldier hit a Russian soldier or vice versa, then they are now in a shooting war with one another, and that could escalate quickly. What do you make of that concern? Well, we are very open about that, that we are asking for the air defense to uh, for a no-fly zone, because that will prevent many, many uh, deaths. Uh, and dead people. And uh, I don't know how many killings should be happening more until 
uh, such decision should should come into into the force. Uh, every day we have dozens and hundreds of of killed civilians and and wounded and uh, destroyed uh, schools, hospitals. Uh, women are um, bringing children to life in in the underground right now in 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 the shelters. So I think right. if there could be assistance in the form of air, air force assistance, of course, that could prevent many many tragic uh, happening. And before I have to let you go, our senior international correspondent, Keir Simmons, spoke to uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and asked him about something that Vladimir Putin brought up or kind of alluded to when he announced this invasion. He kind of broadly referenced that Russia was a nuclear power, and that got a lot of people concerned about what Vladimir Putin would or would not be willing to do. Here is what Keir Simmons asked uh, Mr. Lavrov. Watch. For decades, Russia and America have maintained stability despite fearsome nuclear capability. Can you reassure the world that Russia would not fire a nuclear weapon in anger, would not fire a first strike? We don't have insane people. We have our military doctrine that describes the parameters and the conditions for applying nuclear weapons. It contains no escalation for de-escalation point. So he didn't really answer the question. He said they have doctrine that describes the conditions for applying nuclear weapons. He did not quite answer Keir Simmons' question. Ms. Yasko, before I have to let you go, if not even a nuclear strike, how concerned are you about the potential for escalation, especially if the world gets more militarily involved with something like a no-fly zone? It just feels like this is the kind of thing that could heat up very quickly and more people could get hurt, even if the world comes to try to defend Ukraine. Is that a concern of yours? Well, I'm concerned that if the world doesn't provide more assistance and defense to Ukraine, then that war will come to your countries. This is my biggest concern, because Putin is, is, is a crazy person right now, and we have no guarantees that he's going to stop. Even if he takes Ukraine, that is not going to happen. We will fight till the end. We will defend Ukraine. But uh, security concerns are already in a different countries uh, around Ukraine, uh, our neighbors, uh, Poland, Lithuania, even in Sweden. Uh, there are lots of um, concerns about possibility of a Russian invasion. So if we don't provide enough pressure and the military reaction, then unfortunately it may get really, really, really bad. Lisa Yasko, a member of the Ukrainian parliament, I hope you are able to find safety and comfort even in these difficult times. And I thank you very much for making time to speak to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We'll continue following the breaking news on the ground in Ukraine, partly by shifting the view from the ground to the view from above. Clint Watts will join us for something of a geography primer on the war in Ukraine and his analysis of the breaking story at the nuclear plant in Zaporizhia when we continue. Stay with us. There are 15 nuclear reactors in Ukraine at four sites, and the largest site with six reactors is the site of major breaking news this evening. It is under attack by Russian forces. That's the nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia in southeastern Ukraine. That attack is probably the reason why President Biden is speaking with Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky tonight. We get that word from our Kelly O'Donnell from a White House official. That conversation, of course, is happening as we're learning more about the situation at what is indeed the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. Now, our reporting is depending at the moment on local reports from other outlets. We're doing our best to independently confirm this, but to the best of our knowledge, Russian forces have surrounded and started shelling the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. It makes up at least a fifth, if not a quarter, 
of the country's power generation. We've been hearing from a number of the world's nuclear regulatory agencies, including the International Atomic Energy Agency. The IAEA has been holding meetings all week, including emergency meetings to respond to the situation. They said tonight in a tweet that they are in contact with Ukrainian authorities and they're hoping to promote the peaceful use of nuclear energy. Not to mention the fact that because there is fighting going on around the plant in Zaporizhia, that means that emergency services can't really get there, including firefighters. One of the concerns is the nuclear material. The other concern is just making sure power comes to this power plant so that, for example, electrical systems that keep the reactor cool can remain online. Let's get some more analysis from NBC national security analyst Clint Watts, who's also a distinguished research fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Clint, we had been meaning to walk through the map with you there, but perhaps that gives us another context to talk about the geography of all of this. I wonder what you make of the idea that Europe's largest nuclear power plant is under attack tonight. That's right, Josh. What's super interesting is we've been focused very much up here in the north. This convoy, which we've seen stacked up on the highway, essentially building combat power to go and lay siege to Kiev. But one of the stories we've not talked about maybe enough is what's been going on in the south. While the Russians, they really struggled in the first week and the Ukrainians, they overachieved. Looking at what's going on right now, you're seeing some success by the Russian forces here in the south. This is where I want to bring you up to speed at. In Crimea, this is the units and essentially the divisions that took over Crimea back in 2014. They broke out and created a land bridge over here to Donbass, and they are now laying siege to Mariupol. Separately, you're seeing forces advance on the town of Kherson. Kherson is critically important because the deeper, the Dnieper River, which it goes into the Black Sea, there's a bridge there. And if they can get across that bridge, they can advance all the way out to the Moldovan border. Once they do that, as you can see, they will then control the Sea of Azov here, and they will control the southern coast, essentially shutting Ukraine off from resupply in the south. What we're worried about right now is here. This power plant, which you just mentioned, Zaporizhia is the largest power plant in Europe, and it is uh, the scene of a very intense firefight right now. The videos that you've seen there are quite uh, uh, scary. And this area right here, from some of the reports that we're seeing online, it seems that there was a firefight somewhere around in this area here. Now, Senator Marco Rubio, he thankfully just tweeted out that they think the plant is under control, but there's still nuclear fuel there. But at the same point, as you mentioned, Think about the volume of power and electricity to the whole country. That's part of the reason why the Russians want to take it. They want to be able to control the power supply. Second, this is a hazardous scene right now. Uh, if there were a fire to break out there or if there were some, some munition potentially, you could have more of what it wouldn't necessarily be like a nuclear reactor meltdown, but you could have some sort of a radioactive sort of uh, dangerous device or think of like a dirty bomb that could come from this, it's a very dangerous situation to think that they would do any combat operations in this area is quite remarkable. And it really shows you the length and really that the Russians just don't care that they would even take this kind of risk right now. Yeah, I've just looked at uh, Senator Rubio's Twitter feed since you mentioned that. His latest remark wisely notes that there's all kind of contradictory information from officials in Ukraine, and that is understandable considering that there is a country at war. Another update I want to pass on, we just got some more information from the State Emergency Service of Ukraine, presumably that's kind of like the FEMA of Ukraine. They say that rescuers are on standby, and again, this is coming from government sources, that rescuers are on standby and that power block number three of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is disconnected from the energy system. Four of the blocks are working. According to the state emergency service, the fireproof state at the NPP is normal, and there was a fire behind the territory of the power plant in the training compound. Again, in the training compound. The emergency service also says that while the battle was going on, the firefighters were not, not allowed to get to the fire to extinguish it, and rescuers are on standby. That comes from the State Emergency Service of Ukraine, of Ukraine, a Facebook post that they put out updating what's happening at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine. And it's according to officials, they say that there are rescuers on standby, presumably ready to get in there and put these fires out and deal with people who are wounded. Clint, I wonder how you view this in light of some of the concerns about Russia's strategy. I mean, the idea that you would 
attack an area around a power plant without a very surgical approach seems farcical at best. But then again, this is a war, and there is kind of no way to account for all the variables that will come up, and we know what happens to the best laid plans. How does this factor into your view of whether Russia has thought this all the way through and what this might result in? Joshua, I actually think this is quite consistent with Russia's approach to total war. I, I think one of the things that we've sort of misinterpreted in all of this is that Russia would act more like a civilized Western military force. That is not in their history. If you rewind back to battles in places like Grozny or in Georgia, they annihilate everything. They use indiscriminate, indirect fires, artillery, and missiles. This can go on for days, weeks, and months. And I think if you look at places like Aleppo and Grozny, this uh, really shows that they have no restraint. And I would also add that they use things like nuclear for fear. There's another component to this, which is messaging. Part of their efforts are about using disinformation to scare audiences, and not just Ukrainian audiences or Western audiences, but their own audiences. So don't be surprised if in the coming days you see conflicting narratives about what happened at this plant. Don't be surprised if they try and blame that on the Ukrainians. And they use this as a tactic to essentially create provocation or justification for war inside Russia itself with its own population. Right now, Putin needs support at home. He's, he's losing it. He could use this threat of fear, particularly around nuclear, with the thought of Chernobyl in the country's history, uh, really as a mechanism to try and drive his people under his banner in a time of crisis. I know I got to let you go in a second, Clint, but what does this say to you in terms of the prospects for some kind of diplomatic solution? I, I keep hearing from people, including from the Ukrainian member of parliament that we spoke to tonight, that all of the measures that have been taken by the West now, they're not enough. They're just delaying the inevitable. We would be through this faster if Western nations would establish a no-fly zone, would take a more muscular approach to getting involved in this conflict. The counter-argument is that the minute that a Western bullet hits a Russian soldier, we are rapidly approaching what many people have colloquially, colloquially referred to as World War III, but it could turn into that if you've got a Russia versus NATO shooting war. What's your sense of what all that might mean in terms of the posture the West has taken now and whether or not it's going to prevent more incidents like this? Yeah, so I want to bring it back to the convoy because I think that's emblematic of, of what we're seeing from Russia. They are not worried about air power. Look at the stack up of these vehicles. This doesn't match anything I ever learned in terms of Soviet or Russian military doctrine. Usually they were explained as being very disciplined, having armor formations that were spaced out. This would be a sitting duck if it was a no-fly zone or if there was any sort of NATO air power there. They are not worried about losing them. They have taken significant losses here. The other part that I want to add to this is the entire time that Vladimir Putin and Russia start talking about negotiations or peace settlements, guess what happens? This convoy here, it gets longer and it gets thicker. Supplies, food, fuel, and ammunition are being pumped into this highway. I would imagine that what we're seeing right now in Mariupol, let me back this out, that we're seeing right here in Mariupol is what we are also going to see in Kyiv over time. And what you're going to see the Russians do is build up combat power, particularly from here, you're seeing them come in and creating what we would call an enlargement, essentially securing their rear area. If they do that, they'll be able to protect everything in the rear area and essentially take control. I would expect they'll then also advance forces from the south into the southern end of Kyiv. And then their last goal would be to cut off to the west, essentially blocking all uh, reinforcements and all supplies coming in. So this is siege warfare. It's going to be nasty. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of people calling saying, West, it's just not enough. What are you going to do, U.S., the European Union? What are you going to do to end this? Last few seconds, Clint, cutting off the route to the West, does that mean also cutting off the refugee path and the humanitarian path to try to help people who are still in Ukraine? That's right. So you heard the Russians essentially offer a humanitarian pathway. This is a double-edged sword in terms of what they're trying to do diplomatically. First, yes, you want to empty the population centers and essentially let refugees leave. This, remember, this also puts pressure on many other countries in the area. But it also makes it such that anybody that doesn't leave is seen as a combatant. This is in terms of warfare. They're going to go in and they're going to go out and go at everybody that's left in any of these cities and decimate them. So they're setting up a situation where, one, they can continue to do resupply. Two, they can actually take what could be potential fighters or defenders out of the cities 
and let them move to these refugee uh, stations in other countries. And three, they're setting up the precipice to say anybody that's left is a fighter. And this is open combat. Remember, we're talking about human rights violations, things like that. You've essentially designated everybody as a combatant on that battlefield. And indeed, we're looking at the pictures from Zaporizhia again. It looks like the wisps of smoke that we had been seeing at the top of the hour have gone out. That building in the lower right is where we were seeing that smoke earlier. But again, the State Emergency Service of Ukraine says that the fireproof state at this plant is normal. There had been a fire behind the territory of the plant in a training compound. NBC National Security Analyst Clint Watts, also of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. We appreciate the context tonight. Clint, thanks very much. Thank you. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has displaced more than a million people. UNICEF says at least half a million are children. Most are headed for neighboring countries. A majority of these refugees, as you can see, are in Poland. The crisis in Ukraine brings us arresting, unsettling scenes. A woman in Kyiv waiting for a train inside a busy station. A couple sheltering in a school as the area is under attack. Residents covering shattered windows with plastic. Or a crater made by an artillery shell. These photos were taken by photojournalist Alan Chin of Insider, and he joins us now from Lviv. Mr. Chin, welcome to the program. Thank you. I wonder what your sense is of just what's happened in the last week through the lens of your camera. I mean, take a look at two of these pictures. We'll put them side by side that you took, I believe, about two weeks apart. One of them was of the Kharkiv Ballet on the left, and the photo on the right is something you posted one week ago of people who were kind of throwing themselves to the ground as artillery fire hit the area. I wonder just what your read is on what's happening now and how quickly it escalated. Yeah, I would say that up until the very last moment, people in Ukraine had a mixture of resignation, defiance, um, and even a little bit of denial. You know, everyone maybe expected something would happen. And after all, for the last eight years, there has been this kind of up and down, touch and go conflict in the eastern regions of uh, what's called the Donbass here. But and, and people wouldn't have been surprised if that had heated up significantly. But I don't think most people really, really in their, in their hearts thought that it would be the full-on invasion. You know, they knew it could be because, you know, the American and other intelligence was warning about this. And, and you know, people aren't dumb. They knew it could happen. But I don't think in their hearts that they thought it would happen. And so when it did... It was absolutely shocking. Um, but it also means, yeah, that up until the very last moment, you know, people were at the ballet, at restaurants, nightclubs. And, and I will say this, as you can see from some of my images, even after it started and even as a million people and more have, have um, been, been leaving their homes, there has not been a lot of panic. Um, certainly there's been chaos. There's been disorganization. That's inevitable. But, you know, even in those traffic jams, people mostly obeyed, you know, um, um, traffic rules, right, and, and, um, and so on. So it's, it's, it's a really kind of extraordinary contrast between, you know, something really, really horrible um, and people trying to maintain their, their normal lives as best as they can. And, and you can see from my pictures, I'm staying as far as away as I can, other than that time when right. I was shelled there. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to stay away mostly from the from the front lines. Um, I, I think it's as important to show how just ordinary people are, are trying to get by, right? My pictures are not yeah. so dramatic, but, but I hope they give a little texture and, and detail to what, what ordinary people are experiencing. Well, you've been traveling a lot of Ukraine, as I understand you've been to Donbass and Kharkiv and Lviv and Kyiv and Bilotserevka and Ternopil and a lot of other places. Are there any common bonds or, or anything that stood out to you across the different places that you went to? You, you mentioned this attempt to maintain normalcy as long as possible. Were there any other themes that kind of stood out to you as you made your way around Ukraine? Yeah, well, I mean, so I, I basically have driven in a rental car the entire length of the country, starting from the week before the war started, right, to now a week into the war, right? 
Um, I got to Ukraine on February 9th. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, and it's my actually my third trip to Ukraine, not my first. And I just wanted to see what was going on in, in, in those areas in the East where we did think if anything was going to happen, it would most likely be there. Right. Um, but I'll be honest. Yeah. Once it started intensifying, um, you know, I, I wanted to stay one step ahead of, of, of uh, the fighting, you know. Um, and so I, I, I kept going west, just like these, these hundreds of thousands of people. Right. Um, I did it maybe a little slower than most of them um, because I stopped at a lot of different places. Um, but um, uh, I, I'd say that one thing that really unites the whole country is this sense of shock and 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 then also as it became apparent that this this was a full attack from the russians you know definitely defiance and you know a, a sense that um uh, uh, of, of fighting back um and yeah and then for for those for whom it's uh, appropriate you know to, to leave yeah I, I did want to ask you about one picture in particular before I have to let you go. You caught a moment between a man and his two daughters in Turnipill. Let's let's take a look at this as they were yeah. feeding pigeons there. And I understand that he talked to you about finding little moments of happiness during the chaos of all this. Before I let you go, expand yeah. on that and on what he told you. I, I like that picture because if it wasn't for the fact that we're in the middle of a war, you know, that could be Central Park. That could be in the mall in Washington. It could be anywhere, right? And and his sister is actually one of the people who, who left the capital, Kiev, and came to Ternopol, which is a much smaller city, and and um, uh, for safety. Even though the air raid sirens go off there and, and people have to go to bomb shelters, um, you know, it's still relatively safer, Right. And, and he said that every few weekends, you know, he comes with his daughters to feed the pigeons. It's something they do, and and he's not going to stop as long as he can, right? Because if they don't do that, they're, they're going to go crazy, right? Like, you, you have to make time, even in the middle of, of this very stressful moment in anyone's life. They felt it was important, you know, the pigeons are still there, right? You know? So why not go and feed them and, and, and frolic around for a little bit, which they did. Photographer Alan Chin, I love these still images. I think sometimes, you know, watching this war on television can just kind of create this blur of images that just whips by and almost makes it feel more unbearable than it is. I appreciate being able to have these moments where we can sort of slow down and drink these moments in. Please do stay safe as you make your way around Ukraine, and we appreciate you making time for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Remember, the latest word that we have is that the fire seems to be under control around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. The latest word from its director is that the nuclear security of the plant is secure. That's according to a Facebook post that was sent our way from our team on the ground in Ukraine. The International Atomic Energy Agency has been appealing to the Russians to not only stop the attack, but ensure the atomic safety of this facility. But again, it looks like the fire was not on the premises of the plant itself, but in an area kind of behind the compound, nearby in a training compound that was behind the territory of this plant in southeastern Ukraine. The Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, a Soviet-era plant with six reactors that generates almost half of Ukraine's nuclear energy, a quarter of all the power in Ukraine, and is the largest nuclear plant in Europe. The story could have turned much worse in a very short period of time, but it's still moving pretty fast. So we suggest you follow our live blog for the latest from Ukraine. You'll find our live blog at NBCNews.com and in the NBC News app. In the meantime, we hope you'll follow us. We are at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Feel free to share your questions about all that's been going on tonight and with this conflict, and of course, your stories about how all this is affecting you and people where you live. We're on the phone at 888-575-2NBC, or just send us an email now tonight at NBCNews.com. We appreciate you making time for us. We are back on Monday night. But until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. For all of us at NBC News, including our correspondents in harm's way tonight, thank you for making time for us. 
Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.